When I was 16 years old, I got hit by a car. I was an athletic kid and luckily nearly fully developed. 260 pounds, 6 foot 2, which likely enabled me to survive the collision. When I say I got hit by a car, it wasn't one of those common things. A kid jumps out between two parked cars, gets popped by a car going 10 or 15 miles an hour, scrapes and bruises, etc. The driver of the car ran a red light going 60 miles an hour and hit me in a crosswalk. There were a number of strange things about the incident. I remember every second of the incident with two exceptions. I remember seeing the car close enough to touch. I don't remember the impact of the car hitting me, but I do remember flying through the air. I don't remember hitting the ground, but I do remember every moment after. I can still picture the Subaru logo to this day. The car, a Subaru Outback was totaled and inoperable from the impact, yet somehow I lived. I was with a number of friends at the time. As we were waiting in the corner for the light to turn so we could cross, I noticed that a friend's shoe was untied. I pointed it out and he stopped to tie it. If he hadn't stopped, he would have been hit instead of me. I'm glad it was me though, as he would almost certainly have died. Up to this point, I'd imagine you're thinking that this is a pretty wild story, but not necessarily right. The last and strangest thing I've experienced that night is why I'm posting the story. As I'm laying on the ground, bleeding out from a compound fracture in my leg and a cracked skull, I hear a man's voice. A man who had been dead for over 14 years. My grandfather Pop Pop said, is that Timmy? My grandfather died when I was about three, but I still have tons of memories of him. He and I were best buds. I know without any doubt that I heard my dead grandfather speak. Almost immediately, the devastating pain I'd been feeling evaporated. As I lay there, I can't explain how, but it became clear that I needed to decide what would happen next. I could stay at peace and without pain with my grandfather, or I could return to the pain and fight. I decided to fight, and the second the decision was final in my mind, the pain returned. I was rushed to the hospital when doctors spent the next 90 days fixing a cracked skull, six broken ribs, a badly broken leg, and a silly amount of cuts, scrapes, and bruises. I underwent seven surgeries, spent a year in a wheelchair, and had to learn to walk again. It's now 16 years on from that night. I'm 32, married, have a beautiful four-year-old daughter, and I can't explain how happy I am that I decided to stay. The really surreal thing for me is that I now unequivocally know that there's a life after death. I can't wait to see my pop-pop again, but I have some more work to do here first. I was left with some lasting ah, side effects from that visit to the other side, but that's probably a whole thread on its own. I live in a small apartment with my two older siblings and my mom. We have two cats and a dog. Recently, we had to move, leaving behind a memory in our old apartment I doubt I'll ever forget. I don't quite remember what day it had been, but around three or four in the morning, I headed downstairs to watch a short horror series. Ironic, I know. With my sibling, specifically one of the Alien episodes. I had excused myself to get a snack from our kitchen, just to the side of the living room, which had a TV up against the wall, and our big black couch facing it. This unfortunately meant each time I sat down, my back was to the staircase, and its inky black darkness never failed to unnerve me. As I sat back down, my sibling started up the episode, and I relaxed into the comfortable cushions, awaiting a fun night of laughter. We were probably 10, 15 minutes into the episode, laughing and joking around as we usually do, and something happened that shook me to my core. The only way I can think to describe the noise I'd heard is if someone tried choking a canine of some sort, and its final sound was a gurgled growl of anger. It was the most guttural, animalistic snarl I'd ever heard. I have a fear of dogs due to past experiences, and I've heard my fair share of dog growls, 
This was nowhere near similar. My head had been leaning against the top cushion when it happened, and it sounded like it was directly behind me. It almost seemed to echo around me, causing me to freeze up in complete confusion and fear. I remember my shoulders tensing as I ever so slowly turned to my sibling, a look of shock on both our faces. I swiveled around to look over the couch, shouting, what the fuck was that? My brother had been in the kitchen at the time, rummaging through the fridge. He hadn't heard it. My sibling had, but when we both described the event, they described the noise as if it were quieter. Which makes me feel like it really might have been directly behind me. My brother poked his head in from the kitchen after hearing us freak out, asking what was wrong. We explained, and I remember him staring at us in disbelief and confusion. It was probably just Scully, he said. Scully is our dog, and the idea that it might have been her wasn't exactly reassuring, but enough to calm me a little, since she isn't paranormal. I felt my shoulders untense momentarily, and a breath of relief escaped my lips. Before I heard thumps coming from the staircase. Thump, thump, thump. I turned my head just in time to notice a familiar canine making her way down the stairs. She hadn't been anywhere near me when I heard the sound. I remember beginning to panic again, confusion and denial clouding my mind. Nothing made sense. If it wasn't Scully, what was it? What did we both hear? Why did it sound so enraged? Me and my siblings stayed confused and shaken up for hours after that. My brother retreated to bed, offering us reassurance. At some point, I ended up sitting in the farthest corner from our couch, shaking and trembling like a leaf. My sibling joined me and comfort comforted me as time passed. We'd likely sat there for an hour at least, because soon after, I heard my mom start to come downstairs to get ready for work. She was doubtful when we explained what we'd heard, since she's closed herself off from anything paranormal. She comforted me, blamed it on the dog or something wrong with the couch, and got into the shower. My siblings went upstairs, leaving me alone with my thoughts. For as long as my mom took a shower, I sat in the same spot on my couch, my phone clutched in my hand. I'd started filming. I wanted to see if I could catch it again. I was tense and on edge the entire time, just waiting for that unexplainable sound to happen again. The video ended up lasting eight minutes before my mom came out and ushered me off to my room. I didn't catch anything, but I had a hard time sleeping and to this day, I can't get that sound out of my head. I really have no way to explain it. It was an angry, guttural, almost pained snarl directly behind my head. It wasn't the dog. Our cats were in front of the couch. So what the fuck was it? To this day, even after moving, we joke about having a possessed couch. Each day, the sound fades more and more from my mind, shocking me so much in the moment, replaying it in my head over and over, yet fading so fast. I can only hope we didn't bring whatever it was with us. I've dealt with sleep paralysis and EHS since I was a little kid. I won't delve too deeply into this, but it's not uncommon for me to either feel the beginnings of sleep paralysis, the inability to move, feeling another presence, or waking up seeing shadow people. I've maybe had three experiences. The past couple years so, it's definitely become less frequent than it was when I was young. Honestly, it scared the shit out of me as a kid, and it still does sometimes, but I've grown almost used to it and figured it's in my mind and not real. However, a couple nights ago, my wife and I were visiting her family for Thanksgiving in Kansas. It's a tiny town of 1500 people and very quiet. We were staying in the basement of an extended family member I hadn't met before, so I was already on edge being in a new place. Well, I woke up from a nightmare, the kind that sticks with you. When I woke up to the all too familiar feeling of being unable to move. I was able to move my head a bit and upon walking, I noticed a figure about the size of a taller, bulky dude. There was no noise, 
but I watched it steadily move across the room from one corner to the next. We were sharing the room with my sister-in-law and her boyfriend, so I just figured it was her significant other leaving. They had to head out around 5am, so I thought nothing of it. What did strike me after a minute after seeing this was that I hadn't heard them leave. The house is pre-manufactured from the 70s. The basement ceiling is exposed and it's 100% impossible for anybody to walk up the stairs and exit the house without hearing it. So, I figured he'd gone to the bathroom, which is in the direction that I saw the figure moving toward. By this time I could move my body, and upon positioning myself so I could see the bathroom, it was clear that nobody was there. It was creepy, but what really did it for me was when my wife, who was laying on her side facing towards the bathroom, saw the exact same thing. She said it went into the bathroom and never reappeared. So yeah, we're both a little freaked out. I'm naturally a skeptical person and have always felt comfort in knowing that my experiences were in my mind. But now, I'm starting to wonder if there isn't more to it all. When I think I was around 7, I used to wake up early because I at the time thought I was wasting valuable playtime if I woke up late. I had school at 1pm so I like to enjoy every moment of my morning, waking up sometimes usually at 6 in the morning or earlier. When I woke up, I usually started playing with my Lego minifigures. I like to use the characters more than to actually build things because in my mind I was making movies with them. To emulate the camera, I like to lay on the floor, approaching myself to their faces to make kind of close-ups. So this particular morning I woke up and was doing my usual routine, playing with Legos, and my bedroom's door was wide open. I was playing, then I looked back at the door and saw the legs of a person walking in the corridor right in front of my door and then going out of my sight, in the direction of the living room. They wore a white tennis shoes. I said, hi Elsa, because I immediately assumed the person was my nanny, who usually arrived pretty early. She didn't answer. I went back to my Legos and then for some reason, not much later, I went to the living room to talk to her and she wasn't there. I got confused and went all around the house looking for her, but she was not in the house at all. I ran to my mother's bedroom and woke her and my stepfather up, telling them what happened and asking them if Elsa wasn't really at home. My stepfather said, still sleepy, I heard someone opening the windows. They then went back to sleep, and I got creeped out for the rest of the morning. Sure, it could be my active imagination, or my mind tricking me, and maybe my stepfather imagined hearing someone opening the window, or I had opened a window and didn't remember. But at the time, I was very scared with the whole thing. My nanny only arrived around 9 or 10 a.m. that day, if I recall correctly. I was around 19 when this happened. I was alone in the house and my family went to attend a wedding ceremony. I, for study purpose, remained at home. Also, I always keep my door locked after 11 p.m as I like a quiet environment to study. And also I have a bad habit of smoking. That day, I did the same. I was alone in my room. The main door of the apartment was also locked. I locked my room, turned the light off. It was pitch black. I went to the balcony, smoked a cigar, went back to the room. Turned the light on in the washroom. Went there, washed my face, came out, turned the washroom light off. Went back to the balcony collected my towel, went back to the room, and I saw the washroom light was still on. It hadn't even been 30 seconds since I'd turned it off. I clearly remember that. No way it's turned on. To further examine, I turned the light of the room on and checked the switch of the washroom light. It was still wet, so there's no chance that somehow I made a mistake about turning it off. The incident baffled me. Then I rechecked the door lock and found out that the door of the room was still locked, so there isn't any chance of intruders coming in and doing the deed. Later that night, I was lying on my bed, watching random YouTube videos and soon I fell asleep. 
About 2.15 in the morning, I woke up and suddenly, and I had blurry vision of everything around me as I just woke up and everything was dark. As my vision got normal, I could clearly see someone standing beside my bed where my leg was. That figure was standing in between the bed and the attached washroom. The balcony door was on the right side of the washroom door. It was about four to four and a half feet tall and looked like it was wearing a gray or black gown covered from head to toe. Just like any typical ghost figure we watch in cartoons or whatever. At first I was so scared seeing that I closed my eyes and prayed that I hallucinated and was trying to keep calm, taking deep breath, thinking the next time I open my eyes, it will disappear as I might have been hallucinating. The next time I opened my eyes and saw it was still there, standing still, not moving an inch, nor making a sound, I was literally having difficulty breathing. I could feel my body going numb and every hair on my body was literally standing in fear. I again took time to calm myself by taking deep breaths, closing my eyes, and was thinking of some rational explanation. A few moments passed and my inner skeptic kicked back. I was thinking of the possibility it was being an intruder, but then I thought how could he enter as the door of my room was locked. Then I realized the balcony door was still open and I forgot to shut it. But till then, I was too scared to open my eyes, so I kept on thinking. I came to a conclusion that there's only two possibilities. There's no way I hallucinated twice and saw the same figure, so it must either be a ghost or an intruder. In my mind, I gathered enough strength in these few moments to rationally think it through. But to me, the chances of it being a ghost were slim, but I couldn't disregard it also. So I came up with a plan. Logically, I should defend myself from whatever is standing there. I thought to myself that I should punch the figure as hard as I can, because if it is an intruder, a punch with enough force was the potential to knock him down. And if my punch doesn't connect and rather phases through the body, then it's a spirit or ghost of some kind, and I'll run the hell out of the apartment. It took a bit long to finally commit. In a blink, I stood up, gave the hardest punch I ever could, and it connected. I could feel that I'd hit a target. But to my shock, it was the wooden chair covered with the towel I used earlier to wipe my face. There was no intruder, nor any ghost, and the hardest punch I could give connected to a wooden chair. I was suffering from immense pain. The chair fell down. That day, I gained two things. Firstly, rational thinking is not always necessary. And the second thing I gained was a fractured wrist. This incident was so embarrassing that even my family members don't know the real cause of my broken hand. When I was small, about four or five, I went on a journey with mum. Right up until 15 years later, I merely thought it was just a lucid dream until my mum and I were talking about different things. And she happened to mention the time she accidentally took me astral traveling with her. It's a family talent that I discovered later. Several of my mum's siblings can also do. In fact, on many occasions before this particular time, mum, who was 23 at the time, used to go astral traveling with my 19 year old uncle P, who was in his youth very well practiced in the craft of our ancestors and taught me a fair bit about nature magic, as he used to call it, and the positive magnetic energy of the planet. On this night, P was with his girlfriend, and so Mum was initially alone. She told me that she felt herself slipping away from her natural state as usual, but remembered that I was laying in the bed beside her. So not wanting to leave me alone, unattended, she linked our psyches before transcending to her other state of being, and it was there that I took to be a dream continued. The first thing I noticed was the sound. It was a low toned buzzing I couldn't relate to or recognize. The nearest thing I can liken it to now and even still won't be able to accurately describe it is radio static. I was also aware of all the colors. They were all very muted. Pastels, lilacs, purples, blues, and pinks. 
all looking not quite real, dreamy. The light around and in the colours simmered and pulled gently. I felt the wind, a constant chilly silent wind which slightly made my cheeks numb and fingers tingle. I remember mum holding me tightly around my waist. It actually felt as if we were flying. That doesn't explain the sensations at all well though, as there were several other feelings too. I don't have much recollection of anything else, just waking up the next morning beside mum and remembering the really vivid, happy dream. We were about eight or nine, the day mum took Elle and I over to the heath. It was a hot and bright day in the middle of the summer holidays. We'd been collecting natural materials to make a collage when we got home, and mum's rucksack was full of stray feathers, wild grasses, leaves and twigs. And we were on our way home where Gran was making a cheese flan and salad for dinner. As we were all very hot and slightly tired, Mum had decided that we would wade through the river instead of going back over the hills the way we had come. The thought of pushing my tiny wheelchair through the muddy, bottomed, weed-tangled river never seemed to faze my mum. She was a healthy, fit 26-year-old and knew the heath like the back of her hand. The river wasn't very deep at that part, so Mum tipped my wheelchair back, told Elle to hold onto the handle, and we went in. The water immediately soaked our clothes through, and then Elle and I started to scream, giggle and splash each other in sheer delight. Then we saw them. Weeds? Flowing with the current of the river, swaying back and forth like a woman's long, tangled, unkept hair, and I got the distinct impression that what we saw could have been either thing. I glanced at Elle and instantly knew that she was having the same uncanny notion. The weeds started to curl around our legs and the wheels of my wheelchair, making our progress a little more laborious, and our previous screams of playful fun changed to moans and squeals of unease and disgust as we felt the weeds gently tugging at our legs. At no point did mum ever look anxious or fazed by this experience. She just kept saying, it's only water weeds you two. Come on, don't be silly. You've seen them loads of times. We finally reached the other side of the river, and as mum dragged my wheelchair backwards up the riverbank, Elle climbed up it and sat down beside me. We both just stared in silently at the river and the sea of green for what felt like the longest time. But in actual fact, it was only 10 minutes before walking the rest of the way home. That night, after a hot bubble bath and cheese flan salad in our flannel pajamas and slipper socks around the fire drinking hot tea, we told Gran about our adventure. Our Gran took a sip of tea from her mug and told us the story of green hair. She'd been a real person, though her real name had been forgotten by Gran, conveniently, Ellen and I thought. Anyway, she had lived in the village around 1912, before the area was built up and modernised and developed into what it has become. She was young and kind, with a pretty face and beautiful long blonde hair, a daughter of a gentleman father, and deeply in love with a handsome young soldier. They were to get married, but before they could, the great war broke out and her young man was called up to fight. He was killed by a hand grenade on the front line and when she found out she was widowed before she'd even became a wife, she lost the will to live and driven by grief-stricken insanity, she went to the same river that we waded through and she threw herself in. The river was as wild as the land at that time, and by the time her body was discovered, it was blue, bloated, and half eaten by fish. Her long, corn-coloured hair had become interwoven with the slimy algae and long strands of evil-smelling river weeds which clogged and choked the bed of the river. In fact, the pathologist who performed the post-mortem said that the body may have been found sooner if not for the dark green weeds that appeared to have killed around her limbs and torso, anchoring her corpse to the riverbed for days. From that time onwards, it was said that that river was haunted, cursed or both. Anyway, an extremely bad place. People claimed to see the spirit of the young woman kneeling beside the river and weeping bitterly. More commonly, people often saw the body of the girl floating on top of the water, 
with long green hair and weeds streaming out behind her. And so she was given the name of Green Hair. Elle and I asked Gran why we hadn't heard this story before. Gran just smiled and said because it was an age ago, even before she herself was born. The area was developed and built up, and the river was tidied up and reconstructed. And along with it, the tragic tale of the green hair was lost in the stream of passing time. We didn't altogether believe Gran's morbid tale, but when Elle and I talked about it in bed that night, neither of us could dismiss the eerie feeling that we saw green hair flowing in the river that day. One Saturday, when I was around 13, my uncle came round with his girlfriend and my two younger cousins. And my other two cousins were staying at the flat for the weekend, and a further younger female cousin had asked mum if she could also stay. This was a regular occurrence for us kids. The weekends and school holidays were free for all, a constant stream of kids staying at one place or another, making makeshift beds with bean bags and floor cushions, or just crashing out on the floor with sleeping bags. My mum and aunties all used to joke that in the holidays, their homes turned into regular old DOS house. Apart from my five cousins and I, my friend Jay was there. He too was at our flat every weekend, and his parents knew he would be okay. Mum had the reputation for being cool yet very strict. We all hung out together, had a sandwich and drink and played on the Sega. Then mum and my uncle's partner said we should all go for a walk. Everyone thought it was a great idea, so the ten of us set out. The three adults decided that we should go to Donkey Woods, which is a bit of green wild land owned by the council, much like Heathland. As kids, we used to go over a lot in the spring, summer and autumn on our own, or with family, and it was reasonably safe and kid-friendly, and it still felt wild enough to make you feel adventurous, and not in West London. We all walked the half mile down the road from the flats to Donkey Woods, when we walked along the river, until we got further into the woods, and while mum, my uncle and his partner all sat down to have a cigarette, us seven kids went exploring. As I've mentioned before, we all knew Donkey Woods really well, and were totally at ease and comfortable over there, so we weren't expecting anything unusual or creepy at all. For us, it was just another mid-August, late Saturday afternoon, and we were just messing around. My cousin T, my friend Jay and I were all talking, and suddenly the other four kids came running up. They hadn't been too far away, just slightly further down the river. They were all out of breath and looked a little rattled. The four of them told us that they had seen something weird in one of the small clearings. They wouldn't tell us, just said, you have to come and see. We all thought it was just a major wind up, but when we got to the clearing, our mood changed quickly, not to fear, more like a sense of unsettling apprehension. In the middle of the clearing were three small tents in a rough triangle, and in the middle of the tents was a small, still smouldering fire, and around the edges of the clearing were several small dead birds, sparrows I think. The whole scene was very unnatural and eerie, and I felt a distinct drop in the temperature, most likely my imagination, but still quite evident. Now, the rough sleepers of the area did use Donkey Woods as a base, but not in that particular place of the woods, as it was too close to the main road and the homeless people avoided harassment and abuse from certain unpleasant individuals by going further into the woods to prevent any kind of confrontation. The homeless people who lived over Donkey Woods also didn't use tents. They would make a shelter from pieces of wood and plastic sheeting, and Donkey Woods isn't a place where people go camping recreationally. So we felt there was something very strange about the scene in this clearing. I told the four younger ones to go get the adults. While they were gone, me, J and T didn't move. T, who was and still is as tough as nails, was completely colourless. You couldn't see her freckles at all. I didn't even move my wheelchair around the area as I normally would have done and Jay just kept saying, what the actual fuck? When the adults came back with the other kids, they were clearly unnerved by the odd scene as much as we were. And it was soon agreed by everyone that we should leave the clearing on Donkey Woods immediately. 
The most creepy part of this incident was the next morning. My uncle went to see my other uncle, and together they went over Donkey Woods to look around more. They went to the clearing, but there was nothing there. Not even marks in the ground from the tent poles, no sign of the fire, and no tiny dead birds. A few years back, my mum was coming home after spending the afternoon at my auntie's, cousins and their kids. When she got home, mom told my husband and I about the incident she experienced waiting for a bus. We came from a family of healers and sensitives, so I've had paranormal and supernatural experiences all my life, as has the rest of my family. My mum, although slightly sceptical and a bit reluctant to embrace the gifts which our ancestors have passed down to us, has had her fair share of unexplained events in her own life. She told us that while she was waiting for the bus, suddenly she saw movement from the corner of her eye. Across the road, she saw three youths. In usual circumstances, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary at all, as the shops are a regular meeting place for all the local teenagers. However, there was something slightly odd with these young people. Mum said they were dressed in the period of the 70s when my mum was a young teenager. People were milling about around them, very near them, but no one was acknowledging them. Their existence totally overlooking their presence as if they were invisible to the passers-by. Mum was distracted for a brief moment, and when she looked back again where the mysterious youths had been, they were gone. She even watched the only open shop as she thought they might have gone in. She waited until her bus came 20 minutes and they didn't come out. There was nowhere else they could have gone in the time my mum wasn't watching them. Mum said the most unsettling thing about it was the more normality of the three figures and the fact that she was apparently the only one to see the three. One day, my cousins and I were playing in the back garden. It was a warm, sunny day in mid-July. The air was kind of hazy and full of the sounds of summer. Insects hid in the long grass just outside the boundaries of the safe garden. The garden and heath ran right around without a fence, gate, or any other type of barrier dividing our private back garden to the public. Very busy heath. For example, if you were playing in the back garden and a random person walked past on the way to the heath, they were clearly visible from anywhere within the vicinity of the garden, as well as being very audible. Even down to the point of, if the person knew our family, they were able to conduct a simple conversation with whatever kids were playing there. Gran always told us as kids that the area is directly outside the limit of the garden, it was strictly forbidden, and because she knew us three girls better than the back of her hand, this statement came with an extremely stern warning that if this rule wasn't followed, we would all receive smacked bottoms. We all abided, even though the three of us had adventurous spirits. At the time of this incident, we were all playing on the crazy path that our builder uncles had made to make it easier for my wheelchair to run safely along the ground as I played with the other kids. Elle was pushing me as fast as she could, and I in turn was pushing the ancient family pram that had been there longer than any of us had. We were playing mummies, as usual, being the oldest, our cousin G was mum and picking flowers for the milk bottle in our tree slash bush house. It was more a cluster of bushes at the bottom of the garden, with a clearing which was easier to adapt into a wheelchair accessible tree house, where all those kids played at one time or another. Suddenly, there was a sense of being not alone. I think Elle and I both noticed this at the same time, because we raised our heads and looked in the exact direction where the creeping feeling resided. Just outside the back garden's entrance stood a strange looking figure. We all said after the incident that the figure appeared to be a middle-aged stocky man dressed in shabby dark clothes. He called out, hello, how are you? We didn't answer as we usually did to pass us by who we knew. The stranger continued, I've lost my dog. Have you seen a little white dog? Being ever protective, G answered curtly, no, no, we haven't seen any dogs at all. The stranger didn't look at G, but kept his attention on L and I, although he did respond to G's remark. 
Oh dear, will you help me look for her? She's not very old, and she might be lost. She could have gotten too far. I automatically began to feel uneasy, and I knew Elle felt the same too. As I felt her pull my wheelchair back, I let go of the pram, even though we were a good distance away from the stranger. The stranger was motionless throughout the discourse. Indeed, it was eerie how still he was. G just turned 11, was it adamant. I'm sorry about your dog, but we can't help you. We're not allowed to leave the garden. The stranger remained still and measured. Come on, you won't be away for long. I'll pay you five pounds if you help. Just then, our older male cousin came around the side of the house, pushing his bike followed by a family friend who also lived at the house. They had both returned home from work. Our attention was momentarily distracted away from the figure by their sudden arrival, and when we looked back in the garden, where the stranger had been, he had completely vanished. Seeing his sister G's perplexed look, our cousin H said, What's up with you? We all excitedly told H and our family friend about the strange happening in the man. While the family friend, slightly unnerved by our account, rounded the three of us up and hurried us inside, H immediately marched out the back garden in the direction of where we said the man must have gone, cursing under his breath about dirty old men paving on little girls, only to return 20 minutes later, hot, bothered and cross. Were you three having a laugh or what? He said angrily. There wasn't a man on the way I went, in fact. I never saw anyone at all. It's too hard to play stupid games, you little brats. The three of us were obviously indignant at this slur, as we had all seen and spoken to the same man. Later, when we were in the bedroom with my mum, she asked us about the incident. I still often talk about that day, day with my mum and cousins. We still have no idea where the strange man could have gone, or who he was. Bat Bear was my childhood imaginary friend. He was a small bear type creature, the size of a six year old along with bat ears dressed in a red jumper and blue dungarees with gold buttons. He was with me from age three to nine and he was what my grand thought to be a pucker. The pucker is a fair fairy creature that is a shapeshifter, but it appears as a horse, goat, dog, cat, raven, rabbit, and most commonly, a hare. It was believed that in the rural areas of Old Ireland, they could bring ill or good fortune to the farms and hamlets that they haunted. Bat Bear never told me to do bad things, never did anything creepy or crazy. If anything, he made me want to behave. When I got cross, naughty or sad, he calmed me and always led me to amend my behaviour. Bat Bear wasn't good, nor was he bad. He just existed. He used to curl up at the end of my bed to sleep, sit beside me on the floor as I played and sat beside me when I was in my wheelchair and we read together. He was around for six years, then he was gone as suddenly as he arrived. My gran used to say that puckers were wild and Bat Bear was wild. Looking back at him now, I personally think he really was a pucker, a generous one, and I believe that Gran saw him too. I still like to think he was there when I needed him. I think this happened around four or five years ago, when I was around 16 or 17 more or less. I've always been a skeptical person, and I usually try to prove things by the scientific method. For example, when I was very little, we had a cat, and I pushed her one day from a very high distance to see if it was true that cats always land on their feet. She landed perfectly, by the way. I'm sorry I did it, though. And I know this has nothing to do with the actual story, but I find it very relevant because it explains my initial behavior in the really weird parts of the story. So now to the actual story. This happened in Spain where I live, and I think it was at the end of summer more or less. I went to visit a friend in the town where we both live, and it was a really good day. Sunny, but surprisingly not hot enough so I could wear large pants, which I love. We were hanging out like we used to do at the time, talking about whatever was in her room. It was the most normal and chill day that we could possibly enjoy. 
So she and her mom were the only ones living in the house that summer. And while we were talking, her mom told us that she was going to buy the groceries for the week. So she'd closed everything on the first floor, the windows and doors. And now we were alone in the house. We kept talking about our stuff when suddenly it started getting really windy and the windows on the second floor were all open because it was summer. And we ran to close all the windows so nothing gets thrown and all that. And then just one window is left and my friend asks me if I can close it for her because it's in the guest's bedroom and she's afraid to go in because she believes it's haunted. So I don't believe in this. And we just went inside and closed it without thinking about it too much. Then we returned to the bedroom. I ask her about why she thinks it's haunted and she begins to tell me she and her mother sometimes see a shadow that looks similar to a man's, completely still, facing towards them between the curtains. She also told me that her mother thought it had to be a ghost because when she sleeps, she wakes up and can't move. And then the shadow man would be in her room looking at her from her feet, which nowadays I think about it and we probably didn't know it at the time that her mother was very likely having sleep paralysis episodes. After telling me all this, she starts to get nervous and feeling unsafe, so since I always just want to hang out with her, I offer myself to get up and close the door so she feels better. I close the door and knowingly, I close it so I make sure that it's not gonna open unless force is applied. I put some kind of weight on our side on the floor. Then I look outside through her window and suddenly there's a fucking storm outside, like in an instant, with bolts and everything, and I get a little worried, because that might slow me when I have to walk home later. My friend, who is also weirded out by the sudden change of weather, decides that she wants to keep talking about this ghost in the guest's bedroom. She explains again that she believes it's a real, but guesses it's something else, and calls it a demon, which is why I use this tag. And right this moment when she uses that word, things start to get serious. Thunders start to sound very loud outside, which alerts us. And out of fucking nowhere, we both feel at the same time these chill in the back of our necks. And suddenly it gets kind of cool in the bedroom. She suggests that we get under her blankets, which we do. And when we start talking about these really weird changes inside the house, the door that I had previously closed opens. And it was the fucking worst. It didn't open in a normal way. And it couldn't have because of the weight that I previously set on the floor. But it was fucking slammed against the wall of the bedroom. And it was very loud. At this point, I'm shocked beyond belief. And my friend is legit having a panic attack and is crying about how she's way too scared at that moment. And that she doesn't want to die. I tell her that I'm gonna get up and close the door again and also look outside in case her mom gets to the house and is pranking us or something. She grabs my arm in terror, again saying that she doesn't want to be alone with the demon. And since I'm growing nervous because of the situation and her reactions, after all, we were teenagers back then, I grabbed something big that it was in her bedroom and just approached the door with it for protection. And I told my friend that if anything was going to catch me or enter the room before closing the door, I was gonna give it help before it made anything to her. So she let my arm go. I go to the door and proceed to close it. But before doing so, I showed my head outside of it to see what was going on. And although I didn't see a single thing, I felt like I was in danger if I didn't close the door as soon as possible. I finally closed it and went to my friend to hug her and reassured her that if anything came in, I was beating the shit out of it. I tried to talk to her about whatever so she would calm down because really, she was completely sure we were going to die. And after what happened with the door, I became unsure as well. Minutes pass and things get calmer and we talk normally, but always checking on the door. We finally hear her mom come back to the house and I go outside the bedroom to meet her. She had finished buying and suddenly everything was normal. The house is not cool now, neither is my friend's bedroom. There are no more thunderstorms or storms outside at all. So feeling safer, I go to investigate the house for things that could explain to me what happened. I went down to see if any wind could have opened the door, but as the mother told us, she closed absolutely everything. 
I entered the guest's room to see if anything weird or unusual was happening. Nope. Found nothing that could explain the situation to me. And I know after all that, this may sound weird, but after inspecting everything I could think of, I'm completely terrified. In the end, because of our fear, my friend and I decide it's better that I go home and just leave almost immediately. When I arrived at my house, I saw the time and it was still early in the day. I thought I'd been at my friend's for hours, when really, it was just like half an hour. The event happened around 20 minutes or so, something like that, since my friend's mom left. And in those 20 minutes, even the weather changed and came back to normal. And that was it. But to this day, I still don't know what happened. FYI, floaters are those things that you see in your eye, which look like little worms and move along with your eyeball. They're actually tiny particles that are too small to affect the eye, and too big to be completely transparent. They stick to the eye surface and move as we move our eyeballs. They also form as a result of the gradual decay of the virtuous humour. Look it up if you're still confused. So there still seems to be confusion in what floaters actually are. From asking my teacher and googling it, it seems like there are more than one reasons for floaters. Microscopic debris, decaying of the vitreous humour, and collagen floating around. In any case, these float around in your eye and cast a shadow on the retina, which creates a semi-translucent projection when you see it. Anyways, my cat was sitting beside me, and she sort of randomly put her hands in the air as if reaching out for something. Then she acted like she was trying to chase it, like a bug or something. After some time, she settled down, quite intrigued and admittedly a little weirded out because it's midnight and completely silent. I thought about what it could be, because I'm not really a believer. After a while, it struck me that it could be floaters. Since animals aren't the smartest, they see the floaters floating about and attempt to go after it. I think that it's a bug or something similar, since they obviously can't understand what it really is. And when it's settled down, they return to their normal behaviour. Animals have eyes that are obviously larger and more pronounced than humans, so such floaters are more likely to stick to their eyes. At the time, it made no sense to me. In the dream, I was walking through my garden and not far from me, I could see my father. He was sitting in a sofa, but his facial expressions were blank. He was staring at nothing and his head was tilted to one side, arms beside his legs, and he wasn't moving. I could see a lot of people I didn't know walking behind him, talking about who would get his car and who would keep his watch and other belongings. After I heard this conversation, I felt angry and started to yell he wasn't dead and to go to hell for acting as vultures over his possessions. That was the end of the dream. A few days went by and I told my best friend about it. It made no sense for us because my dad was alive at the moment and he was healthy. Three months forward, I was at another city and received a call from him. My sister and I lived together, but when we reached the cell phone, it was too late. We tried to call him back, but he didn't answer. Later that day, our mom called us to let us know my dad was ill and a car would be picking us up to come home. We arrived home only to learn our father passed away that day. A few years before, there was one day I couldn't find him. My parents were divorced and I was living with my mom. I went to his house and the TV and lights were on, but he didn't open the door. I came back crying, thinking the worst. Somehow he knew I was looking for him and arrived to my mom's house like 20 minutes later. He asked why I was crying. I told him I thought something had happened to him. He just hugged me and laughed, but he made me a promise. He said, when I leave, I promise I'll call you to let you know. He kept his promise. Only after the funeral, I noticed I dreamt of his death. My mom was the one who found him. And when I told her my dream and how I saw him, she looked at me scared. The position and the place were the same. Also, 
After losing my father, I developed a strange ability. I can now tell if someone has a long time to live or if their time is almost up. Me and my partner have been experiencing some paranormal activity over the three years we've been together. We're currently living in a new flat, so no one's lived here before my partner, as it's his flats and I'm sort of living between his and my parents. At the beginning of our experiences, it just started out with the kettle turning on and off, so we thought it may have been faulty, and bought another one to find out it does the same as it did before. After that, it progressed into objects moving around and finding them in places we know we definitely didn't put. That they're for example finding keys in a sock drawer, or something silly like that. And even things have been thrown at us off the wardrobe and onto the floor in early hours of the morning, which is the worst and really gets my adrenaline going. A few months back, I bought an EMF detector and began working with it and of course, it goes off quite a lot to the yellow red zone for a few minutes, and then that will be it for around an hour. I wrote this section just to give the range of what the spirit can do, so you guys can give me some information hopefully. This month, it's decided, nah, I'm a proper shake things up, and it started tapping under the bed three times every single night, and it waits for you to just about fall asleep and then you hear the tap 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 and it wakes you straight up with the vibrations of the taps on the mattress. You can also hear a lot of rustling in the corridors at night. I went home the other day to my bedroom and my parents' house, which is miles away from my partner's. I've had a bunk bed from when I was younger, but without the bottom bunk and desk instead. So there I was at 3.30ish in the morning, cuddling my cat in bed going to sleep, and tap, tap, tap. And this time I shot straight up, because in my brain, I was processing the fact that I'm in a different household and it's literally followed me home to tap at me. And it was so much louder than at my boyfriend's flat, which honestly really shook me up, as it was the last thing I expected when nothing had happened like this before. Last night, I was super tired and fell asleep really quick and it banged on the mattress this time until I woke up and to be honest, I'm getting a little frustrated as I don't sleep much anymore and running out of ideas of what's going on and how to stop this from developing into something else. When I tell it to stop, the EMF detector goes wild, so assume that's a no. Any ideas on how to get it to stop doing these things? I don't mind it living here, I just sort of want it to slow down. So yesterday, I got high with my boyfriend at their mother's house in the shed. As I was coming up, I suddenly felt really nauseous and dizzy and burned all over me. I then felt minty fresh as high me described it, and the whole room was oddly really cold. I was just closing my eyes and relaxing when out of nowhere, I went, there's someone else here too, and pointed into an empty space of the shed. I had my eyes closed, but I could sense the presence and track them. I walked over to the spot where I could feel a presence and I started shaking every time I went super close because of the energy I could feel in that spot. I then decided to sit back, back down because I was shaking and here's where things took a turn. Still with my eyes closed, I could now see the energy I was picking up on. I felt really warm and loving and protective. I started to describe a man which I could feel my boyfriend tensing up at because it was their grandpa. I've never seen any pictures of him before or even a description, but I know his death had a really big impact on my boyfriend. They were really close when my boyfriend was a child. I started uncontrollably crying. My body felt so heavy with longing and sadness, but also love. I felt so overwhelmed with protective love that I started to cry. I kind of lost control of my mind and just started speaking everything I saw or heard. And I was able to feel their grandpa's thoughts and memories and like to speak to him without any words. When I asked a question, the answer I just realized I knew, even though it wasn't something I knew before. For example, I was telling my boyfriend I wanted a hug 
and that I really miss them and just wish that I could hold them again because that's where my brain felt. I hope that makes sense. It ended up in me hugging my boyfriend and telling them how much I loved them, but not my kind of love. I felt like family love at that moment. I felt their grandpa's protective presence and I saw him smiling at me and being happy as I told everything he felt to my boyfriend. It's so hard to explain how it felt when his grandpa was there and how I just knew what to say. Although I knew everything, it felt hard to translate what I knew into words. It was like speaking two different languages that were remotely different. I felt a female presence watching from outside the shed, but being too shy to come forward and just being like, nope, that's your business, to the male presence. The way the woman and man were speaking to each other, my boyfriend said was very typical of how they acted when they were alive. I then remember seeing my current boyfriend as a child, but in memories from the perspective of the grandpa. I kept on seeing an image of them two gardening together, which my boyfriend teared up at as they used to garden together as a child. And I only just found out when I brought it up. A few small other things happened to do with memories, but I'll keep it brief for now. Then, I felt his grandpa's and grandma's presence leaving, and I felt the same nauseous feeling as they left us and grew weaker. Shortly after, we went back in the house, and I started to feel energetic. In the kitchen, I sensed loving meals and good food, which my boyfriend's grandpa made them. And in my boyfriend's current room, I said productivity and focus, which used to be his grandpa's old study. I then later on at night started to name words like wood, paint, project, model, eventually to model kit, which my boyfriend said they had up in the attic above us. I also kept on feeling a memory of staring out of the window into the garden, which my boyfriend said their grandpa used to do a lot. Lastly, I told my boyfriend the ground here had been lived on and has a strong feeling of family love and turns out, despite their great grandparents building their current house, the land space had been in their family for generations. I didn't know this before. My friends and I were hanging out at a little park in our hometown, which is right behind a Taco Bell. We were just chatting, having a good time. And then one of my friends decided to go into the Taco Bell to use the restroom. We live in a small town in Northern California where no crime really happens. So we let her go on her own. It was around dusk at this point and the park was bordered by a creek and undeveloped land. While my friend was gone, we heard her voice yell my name and she sounded incredibly scared. She has a slight accent which makes her voice hard to imitate and I have a very unique name that is difficult to pronounce. So there's no way someone else was just playing a joke on us to scare us. I obviously got scared that she was being kidnapped or something so I jumped up and headed over while calling her name. I was with two other people sitting at the table. My other best friend and her boyfriend. They're both skeptics and don't really believe in paranormal things, especially the boyfriend. But when they heard the voice screaming my name, they both recognized it as hers and jumped up alongside me. I started screaming her name, trying to figure out where she was so that we could go help her. And then we saw her coming from the complete opposite side of the park, where Taco Bell was. There was no way that she could have made it all the way to the back of the green space and back in the amount of time that she'd been gone for. She also hadn't heard the voice calling her name, even though she should have as the Taco Bell was maybe 150 feet from where the three of us were sitting. She's a quarter Native American, and although none of the rest of us are, we were speculating on what it could have been, and we were thinking it might have been a skinwalker or something related to that, as our experience seems to line up to stories that we've heard about skinwalkers. Our entire town was built on a Native American burial site. It's awful, I know. So there's definitely activity related to that happening. I've had weird experiences in my own house, and both of my best friends have witnessed them as well. Do you think our experience might have been skinwalker related? If not, what are the other possibilities? I'm a very anxious person and I'm a little on edge about this whole experience. So any insight that you could offer would be very much appreciated.
My dad passed away in August 2020. Not from COVID, he had a serious heart disease. I'm 20 and live with my boyfriend in another town. My sister's 16 and lives with mom. So me and my boyfriend went to my hometown together for the funeral. Anyway, I'm the kind of person who prefers to ignore pain as a defense mechanism. So I tried to keep the atmosphere as light as possible. I really tried to distract everyone from grief. So we spent some time watching movies, playing video games, talking about normal stuff, etc. The first weird thing happened a few days after our arrival. Shortly before that, I began to get interested in 3D modeling and spent a lot of time on the computer and phone studying this topic. One morning I woke up and scrolled through some memes on Reddit and then saw that my battery is low and decided to put it under my pillow. And I perfectly remember how I did that. From the morning to 12 p.m., without even visiting a bathroom, I was in bed with my boyfriend. We were making 3D models. No one visited the room and I'm 100% sure that no one tried to grab my phone from the pillow. But yeah, a few hours later, I decided to check it out and didn't find it. We searched everywhere and then I found it right next to my dad's portrait in his bedroom. My mom wasn't even home. My sister said she didn't leave her room and we know that she didn't come to our bedroom. I asked everyone a few times. They all said they didn't touch it. When my mom came back, I told her this story and then jokingly said, remember how dad just hated that I was on my phone all the time? <laughs> Maybe he's trying to say, forget about the phone. Spend some good time, time with your family. My mom looked at me with all seriousness and said that I may be right. And she didn't even think of that. Turns out she's been crying for a week. Every night she talked to my dad about how difficult it is for her. We went to the kitchen and spent a few hours discussing things. In the end, she said that dad was right. We needed to talk. Later, after we came back home, we all saw dad in our dreams on the same night. I saw him in the apartment where I grew up. He was in a white suit that he never had. I ran to him in tears and hugged him. And he said, hey there, why are you crying? We're all going to the restaurant. It's going to be okay. I heard my mom and sister's footsteps and then woke up. I immediately messaged my sister about this when I woke up. Surprisingly, she said, Ong, I saw him in a dream too. She saw him in our old house working like he always used to in the same white suit. She cried and immediately hugged him and he calmed her down. And finally, we told mom and she said she saw him too. Same white clothes. In a dream, she was in their current apartment and they accompanied me to another city. My dad waved to me, saying goodbye. Then he turned his head, smiled and told mom, well, and I'm gonna stay here, and hugged her. Mom even said that our dog was surprisingly happy that night. He was running and barking while sleeping. Maybe my dad visited him too. Anyway, maybe that's silly. But I just want to believe that was my dad. Last week, I was at home watching a movie. I was reclined in my chair, which faces a window that faces another building with a small amount of grass between. I live in a basement apartment, so the windows are at ground level. They're about two, three, two feet tall and three feet wide. I doze off and fall into a deep sleep. My dog is sleeping on my lap. I'll mention that my dog barks at any animal or wind rustling leaves outside the window. No people ever walk by it given its location, but occasionally a bird will come by. I wake up abruptly from my sleep with intense alertness. My eyes open wide quickly, like an instinctual response. I remember immediately feeling like I was being watched. Simultaneously, I look straight at the window. I'm staring right at this face. Our eyes are locked on each other. I remember feeling nothing but extreme alertness and fear, but also very calm. I had this absolutely knowing that it had been watching me sleep, sleep for a while. It felt more curious and threatening. It was bizarre and I felt like I couldn't move, like I was hypnotized. Anyways, we stare at each other for a solid 20 or so seconds. I'm just laying there still, 
unblinking. My mind was shifting through possibilities to rationalise logically what it could be. I wanted it so badly to believe it was an animal, but its face was bare of fur with human coloured skin. It was very small, no way it could have been a human. It had to be the size of a one-year-old child if that was the size of its face. I couldn't see its body because it was dark outside, but my apartment was lit by Christmas lights. It looked like it was leaned on its arms with its face as close to the window as possible. It was strange to me that my dog was not barking. He laid there still with me. This is when I think I might have been having sleep paralysis. Or something. I have sleep paralysis very often, and this didn't feel like it. It felt more like a trance state. I felt connected to it somehow. I get the nerve to sit up and get a closer look, and mumble, what the fuck? That's when it backs away. I remember my thought process being in slow motion and clear. I tell myself to listen closely to see if I can hear four legs, or two. It gets up and runs away. This is where my dog starts barking. That's when I know for sure I'm not imagining it. I hear it run distinctly on two feet. It sounded so small, and I could tell by the sound that its gait was very small. I sit there confused as shit as my dog goes crazy. I check the time. It's 4.47am. Guys, I have no idea what to think. It does correlate with one thing, though. In late August, I started building a shrine slash temple type thing out in the woods at a large nature park. It was my favourite spot to go meditate or practice my harmonica or write. It became an encompassing spiritual ritual to go out there. The whole thing was a meditation type practice and it's basically a big teepee made from dead tree trunks and branches with a stacked stick circle inside. I had worked tirelessly out there being in a kind of union with nature in my mind as I built. I meditated and carried the meditation out with action. I remember one night at 1am, a friend and I were sitting out there. We were in the middle of a conversation when my friend's face turned into panic slash worry. I stopped talking and could hear footsteps coming towards us. It was already loud and distinct, as if close to us, but we sat and listened for a long time as it kept walking closer, but never got to us. We decided to leave, and she doesn't like talking about it because of the feeling of the energy and the air as we acknowledged it. Anyways, someone has totally destroyed my shrine in October, and I left it as is. It crushed me, and I would often visit the ruins heartbroken. To wrap this tangent up, the day this happened, the creature watching me sleep, was the same day I went out there and suddenly felt a strong urge to rebuild it. I cleared everything and started again. After a few hours, I came home and fell asleep. And then this happened. <laughs>